right, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today, our episode is a follow-up to our last episode, actually. Uh, my guest today is Bonita Roy. Bonita Roy has been on the podcast before. Uh, she wrote an essay for us on in issue three. Um, I believe she's also going to show up uh, in issue four in our issue on Christopher Alexander. Um, and today she reached out to me because uh, she had some thoughts on my conversation with Evan Thompson. Um, I'll post a link to that conversation below, but that conversation was basically about Evan's book. We covered two different uh, territories in that episode, mainly. It started with a kind of retrospective look at um, his book, The Embodied Mind. It was reissued after being published uh, 20, over 25 years ago. And then we also talked about his new book, Why I'm Not a Buddhist, which was about this concept, Buddhist modernism. Um, and there, Evan gave us a kind of historical reconstruction of the different ways that um, Buddhism had been taken up and appropriated into the West and how that happened, um, the history of the sort of the colonial exchanges between Westerners and Buddhist practitioners, how that got translated back into practices that we now recognize as Buddhist in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, it was a pretty wide ranging conversation and it was in that context that uh, Benita reached out to me and said, hey, I think this is really interesting. I think there are also some other themes in here that we can flesh out some other topics. So part of what you're going to hear from Bonita right now is uh, a little bit of commentary on that discussion that we had with Evan, but then she's also going to take us into some other territory, some conceptual, philosophical, and even metaphysical questions that arise when we start to open up questions of science, philosophy, and uh, practice and meditation. So I'm going to kind of sit back in the first part of the episode. Benita is going to talk a little bit about some of these issues and the themes that she wanted to bring up. And then I'll come back in the second half um, and ask her some questions, and we'll have a little bit more of a dialogue. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Bonita. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so the story of um, me piggybacking on the issue, the episode with Evan Thompson is um, that I was listening to Evan Thompson and I had read his book, Why I'm Not a Buddhist. I've read his Waking, Dreaming and Dying book and I've read uh, his book, Work with Varela. And what I felt, it could be a projection, but I, what I felt is he was being generous in his critique. And I think partially was because there is the critique of Buddhism as a topic, as an intellectual topic. And then his, uh, I think, appreciation for certain communities that maybe are Buddhist centric. And um, a, a rough critique might not have um, might have been too dishonoring of some of the wonderful Buddhist communities that, that are around it. I think that him living in these two different worlds, uh, that was my impression because I think some of his books and some of his writings have stated a, har a more harsh critique. So um, this may, not, may or may not be true, but that's uh, how it ignited this um, desire in me to follow up. Now, what I'm having said that, what I'm going to say, I don't think he would agree with. I'm going to try to make a harsh, more of a harsh kind of bullet critique um, <clears throat> that maybe we can nuance afterwards. So that's one framing. The other framing is my uh, hope is to open up a line of questioning that somehow is taboo in a lot of these communities. There's some kind of um, resistance to asking clear questions around some Buddhist practices. There's always a sense that, oh, well, you're not enlightened enough, or you don't get it, or there's some kind of um, uh, teacherly authority that's being violated. So I think it's really important that with the popularization of mindfulness, and in a lot of these podcasts, you see uh, what uh, Peter Lindbergh calls Buddhistic uh, kind of orientations. I think that it's uh, timely to really um, start examining, opening up a line of question in, in 
in a lot of these areas. Uh, now, having said that, you know, uh, I know you had Evan Thompson on the podcast and you had listened to him and Sam Harris. And the last thing I want people to do is say, okay, there's Evan Thompson over here and there's me and Sam Harris over there. And I will try to um, highlight why I'm not saying what Sam Harris is saying. And one of the reasons is, is because when Sam Harris says Buddhism is science, he's thinking that it is parallel scientific materialistic reductionism. And what I'm going to say is that science is our friend, contemporary neuroscience, but it's not reductionistic. It's not, it doesn't make, what I'm saying, it doesn't make the same move that Sam Harris does. And so hopefully I'll be clear on that. And so if your audience is here, ah, there's Sam Harris. This is uh, not at all how I'm going to try to come across. So I'm not in that camp. All right. Um, one of the things, one of the concerns I have about Buddhist practice in their Western interpretation, and this can be what Evan talked about, um, appeasing the Western mind, is that I don't think it's an adequate spirituality to address the problems we have today, the ecological problems, environmental problems. I think it, it leaves us subtly with the sense that the human is separate from nature and that the mind is separate from the body. And so, you know, you could argue that Christianity didn't separate spirituality from nature because we had St. Francis of Assisi, you know? And so there's a lot of Buddhists who have taken up their compassion for the body and for nature, but it's still somewhat problematic because if I have compassion for nature, it's still like I'm a human who has compassion for nature, not that this sense of complete interbeing with nature. When I look at nature, I see in my human nature, the same nature that I see when I point to the forest, the rivers and the trees, right? So we have this, we have this concept in the Eastern traditions of your original nature. And when we use that term original nature, in the Western mind, you move, you can see people imagine a transcendent realm, your original nature. My original nature, I was a soul in heaven, or I was at the foot of God, or I was in some kind of immaterial metaphysical place, right? And what I want to say is, how can we move to a paradigm where when I say your original nature, that word nature means the exact same thing as when I point to the rivers and the trees and the forest and I say, that's nature. So why do we, you know, you could feel the dis dis differences that we have when we use the term nature in the spiritual Buddhist term and when we use nature in the environmental, ordinary, planetary, uh, cosmological kind of systems term. And can we move so that without being reductionist on either side, where we see them as communicating the same properties, the same qualities uh, with, with, you know, distinction. And, um, and I think that if we uh, start with Buddhism or start with some of the practices, but we move toward this other kind of interpretation, I think we could have a very powerful uh, spirituality that can um, animate the living world, animate our body, um, give us an understanding of consciousness and cognition um, that I find is blows my mind, you know. So uh, that's that's my hope within this critique. I hope that there's uh, that positive benefit also. Let me just touch on some examples. Um, <clears throat> First of all, they call it mindfulness. They don't call it bodyfulness. So I think, I think that's interesting. But let's say we take a, um, all these practices start with uh, giving instructions to the body, right? Sit in your chair, relax, uh, change your breathing, um, get settled, take the lotus position, 
Um, in Qigong, we have different mudras you might take. And so we are, we're very aware that these practices start with instructions for the body. And then as we move through the meditation, for example, we have an, an experience. And the interpretation is very subtle. Now, no one will agree, disagree with it. Very few people will disagree with this interpretation, but it's not the interpretation that's highlighted. When we arrange our bodies in a certain way, we predispose our mental state or our perceptual state in the process. But the teachings are such, they, they, they're given as if the arrangement of your body is just the preamble. When what we know from neuroscience is that state alterations are outcomes of bodily arrangements. You see the difference? It's like, and for me, it's like, wow, that's what I wanna learn from meditation that just, just arranging my body in a certain way can transform my perception, can transform the way my mind works, can trans alter my relationship interpersonal relation can change my mood and my psyche. And I think this is fascinating. It's not reductionistic. It's, it's kind of magic, you know, I don't, I don't, but the teaching is such that that arrangement of the body, what we do with our bodies is kind of just melts into the background. And then as if the mind then is liberated to do its own thing. If we put the body aside, then the mind can achieve these these other uh, experiences. But what I want to say is that there's plenty of neuroscience around now that um, shows you that how the body is constitutes itself, how, um, you know, just even when we say in meditation, you change your breath. And that just is taken for granted. Yeah, we're going to change our breath and it massages the vagal nerve. And all that is maybe communicated, but the end of outcome is taken away from that, you know, taken away from the fact that this is experience has comes from your body as your body through your body. And we can get very detailed. I've studied a lot of them, but they, we, what we know, for example, is um, how you, how your thoughts compose themselves it has a lot to do with the cicadic movements of your eye. So if you do Cassini practice or you do any kind of single point meditation, you're not really tapping into some kind of magical realm. You're controlling the eye movements, which is directly related to how your body arranges your mental uh, activities. And so I think that's fascinating, you know, but nobody says, okay, the reason why this works is because if you stop tracking, your, your eyes track, you compartmentalize thoughts and images and part of perceiving internal or simulated speech or simulated imagery, your eyes do that work for you, okay? Am amongst other things. And that the instruction is rearranging the way you move your eyes, hence you have this effect. So there's, there's a lot of ways in which we can parse these experiences and these intelligences, these multiple intelligence of the body down to what the body, how the body arranges itself, how it arranges itself in, um, in collective space is also a big deal. You know, you, you put people in a room together and before without doing anything, if you watch your body, you watch other bodies, a lot is already happening. And so a lot of what then is facilitated is not actually facilitated. It's already in motion. You know, there's already affect, there's already entrainment, there's already mirror neurons, there's already all this going on. And then the teaching kind of does a little bit of magic trick and then says, there, you see, you see, that's what I've done. And, and so, um, I, th I think that if we can reconcile the mind-body gap, we can then reconcile the, the human nature gap because this I think is what's really hard for us psychologically. We assign certain qualities to the mind that are immaterial and metaphysical 
And then we assign certain qualities to our body and those qualities are physical and material. And so we assign qualities to nature that are physical and material and we're caught in a double bind because we know we are not just physical material beings in this reductionist sense. And so that's why I'm not Sam Harris because I don't want to close the gap by saying we're just like nature, the mind is just like the body and those things are physical materialist and deterministic. I want to say our bodies just like nature and the qualities we assign to our mind are qualities of the body. And those qualities that we assign to consciousness exist in nature also. And so to me, um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's so close to the Western Buddhist imagination already, but we compartmentalize. So you have a lot of Buddhists that are interested in indigenous thought. Or I was happy to see Evan Thompson when you asked him, well, who do, you know, what Eastern traditions do you read? And he mentioned Taoism. And in Taoism, you know, the five elements work in your body, they work in nature, um, everything is in the same field, all the principles of nature are the principles of your body and mind and psyche. And so I think Taoism is also um, gives us a model, uh, at least a pre-modern model of, um, yeah, something that is kind of an integration of shamanism and indigeneity with Eastern uh, kind of uh, approaches. So, um, yeah, that would be my hope. Um, we could talk about, uh, as I tell my students, you know, my, old science is not your friend. You know, a lot of my students come and they're like, ah, science is reductionistic. Who wants to read yet another book about how the brain does this and the brain does that? And so, you know, new science is, th these things are not seated in the brain. They're seated in complex holistic dynamic processes, rhythms of the body brain. Um, and, um, and in this sense, I think really modern uh, uh, neurophenomenology and neuroscience um, can be our friend that closes the, these gaps and uh, brings us to kind of a, a living animated world. Uh, and I'll just, in my preamble here, give you one, one example that I do in my courses. I show this clip, like they have these really cool clips of it's uh, people who animate what it looks like in the side the cell. And, um, and they're highly scientific. And there's this clip on a TED talk where you see the ribosomes come together, right? And the ribosomes are little factories inside the nucleus of your cell. I mean, they're, they're little. And they come together and they build a factory where DNA comes in, your, your, yeah, your DNA comes in and the messenger on RNA, it's all the stations so that these, these, um, these molecules can do their work and it unravels the DNA and it has to flip the reverse one upside down and all this stuff happens, right? And like there's an intelligence there, a self-organizing intelligence, um, that is profound, it's like wild, right? Nobody knows how to, they do this. They don't, okay, the, the molecules don't know how they do it, but there's an innate intelligence. And I would say that this is what consciousness is. It's, a, it's the ability to come into relationship in ways that are intelligent and create novelty and all this crazy stuff called life. And, and um, so I think it's not, it's, you know, so if we re, we can really reanimate at the level of the molecules. And um, we know that our mood is controlled by the gut biome and there's more bacteria in your gut. If you exclude your immune system, there's more cells of bacteria in your gut than human cells in your whole body. And they're, they're not human, right? And so, and what are they doing? They're just bodies in space also enacting and animating uh, their own intelligence, which is part of the intelligence of the human. So this is part of what makes us conscious. And so if we animate and we see these, this intelligent animated agents at all levels all the way through, um, I think that's 
that's really lays out a spirituality we need that um, not only invests in new science, but also um, gives us a sense of profound meaning and fit, fit into the world, fit into the natural world. Um, and, and, and for me, it, it, it brings out profound gratitude. You know, here I am a human through no effort of my own. I can see, I can hear, I can smell, I breathe, um, I can walk. Um, and all of this has been gifted to me by, by all the activities and all the evolution and all the ongoing intelligence of, of nature. So, um, yeah, so that's the hope. And um, um, we, can, we can get into some more critique bullet by bullet later, but um, yeah, that's, that's where I'm going with it. <laughs> cool, thank you for that. Yeah, really interesting. I wrote down a uh, number of questions and notes. Um, I think where we should start maybe is a more general point that I think it's important to keep in mind here, which also came up. Uh, it came up a little bit in my conversation with Evan, but it mostly came up when I was talking to other people. When I first read the his book, Why I'm Not a Buddhist, I wrote uh, just a short little summary of it. Um, it some other folks kind of clicked into it and started asking me questions about, you know, these are Buddhist practitioners, I, I've said before, I'm not a, a Buddhist practitioner. It's not really my wheelhouse, but it is something that I brush up against fairly frequently in, in, in dialogue circles and, you know, a little bit in my own research, but I'm certainly outside of my comfort zone when talking about it. So one of the things that came up in response to the essay, uh, which you sort of touched on as well, was just this idea that there are, there are so many um, different practice traditions that are sort of captured by this really sort of, you know, 25,000 foot high view that we use and call Buddhism. Um, and the response to the Buddhist modernist piece was um, basically just kind of questioning, well, aren't we painting with too broad of a brush here? Um, are all Buddhist modernists uh, really like Sam Harris or Robert Wright was the other person in the conversation. Um, and there are certainly other ways to be uh, a modern Buddhist practitioner in the West. The, the person who came up in that context was Joanna Macy. If you know Joanna Macy and you know Sam Harris, you know that these are quite different characters. They're both Westerners doing a version of, we could say, Buddhist modernism. And I heard you say something similar in the beginning when you said, okay, I'm going to champion a sort of a scientific perspective, but not a Sam Harris style scientific perspective. And I actually see Evan doing this as well. Um, you know, he's even written papers about neurophenomenology. You know, this was a, a focus of his work uh, with Varela from the early days, you know, this kind of circulation between uh, phenomenological philosophy, phenomenological practice, and uh, whatever it was uh, we could glean from, uh, you, you know, properly scientific uh, investigation, you know, which usually involves like, you know, technological measurement, instrumentation, fMRI, this kind of thing. Um, what Evan is really worried about is what he calls neural Buddhism, um, which is kind of this brain-centered reductionist view of Buddhist practice. Um, and I hear you kind of saying the same thing. So I'm wondering if we could, could flesh out a, a little bit more what those differences are, uh, given that Evan also has a, you know, a, a sort of science friendly attitude towards these things, but I'm sensing that you're wanting to say something different. So maybe mm -hmm. we can flesh out what those differences are a little bit. Yeah, so <clears throat> let me give you an example. Um, <clears throat> we know a we know some things from from neuroscience, and for example, we know that um, we have many different types of processes running unconscious all the time that give us a sense of where our body is in space. So this is called the body schema, and. We also know 
that in addition to this subsystem, the body schema that integrates perception, proprioception, um, interoception, these are very complex systems. They integrate many systems. You can't just say it's in the eye or in the inner ear, or the balance, you know, these are, these are complex systems. So the body schema is one system that's semi-independent from what we would call, and is called in the literature, the body image. The body image is a subtle imputation of your third, a subtle third person perspective imputation image concept of your body in space. And the reason why we know these are separate is because people can have lesions or diseases in their brain where one goes offline and the other one's online and vice versa. Sort of like blind sight. <clears throat> blind sight you can see, but you don't know you can see. These are ways in which in neuroscience we know that they're semi-independent systems. And in ordinary waking reality, they, they work together, they self-correct. So, for example, I had a, a horse injury. I had an injury on my uh, ankle, very bad injury. And for a while, while it healed, my heel no longer sent afferent information to my brain about where it was because it didn't have any nerves. And so my, that's part of the body schema, constantly sending afferent information to your brain about where it is. My brain then, because it couldn't find my heel, would not let my body, not my brain, it's a whole thing. The communication was such that it would not let my heel go down first when I stepped with that foot. It would stub the foot pot, you know, the fat part of the foot and then go down. And so you, I watched this happen, you know, and I watched like, if I looked at my foot, then I could put my heel down because I was relying on the image processing of my body to make a normal step. And so um, just to complete the picture, this is Buzaski's work. And, and what happens is that the, the information coming up from the body schema, the sensorium is compared to a snapshot that the mind has of the last time, and that's the efferent uh, rhythms. They're, they're global rhythms in the, brain, in the body, and they include all kinds of pathways. And these two images, the image and the schema, all subsystems are compared and then ingested, either by the action of the body or you update your schema. And this is how the whole, basically what we call mind is like the efferent rhythms and what we call body, the afferent rhythms. If you wanna like have a really shortcut way to see how we're talking about one system, that's what's happening. And so, um, so what, what happens is now that we know that there's a subtle unconscious third person perspective operating you on you all the time. If you take, if you're, if you have an out of body experience and you have perceptions offline and this is offline and that is offline, you can be left with only the body image. And this would give you the sense that you're looking at yourself from up in the air. I mean, I've had these experiences. And so we have, so people don't like that when you know, students resist that because then they think, oh, well, so there's no consciousness. And I say like that the body can do this is like freaking phenomenal. Like I find it, it more empowering. Like I find it fascinating um, that these mechanisms, you know, we suspect them and we can isolate them as global processes. But I contend, and this is where I'm not Sam Harris, is that they are not consistent with any kind of scientific reductionist causality. They're complex emergent processes that work at thresholds and sub-threshold levels and, and that gets into a whole other thing, but you're not going to be able to uh, 
linearly identify causal sequences because of the nature of the processes are already um, complex processes that have complex feed loops. But um, so this is a, if you read modern neuroscience, you can, you can clearly understand things like blind sight, out-of-body experiences, hypnagogic states. It all happens to be what's online and what's offline. And then you can start to see some of these meditation instructions and you see they put this offline, they put that offline. Then they hypertrophy perception or they hypertrophy something else. And, and it's a very interesting, if, if Buddhism was really scientific, you could, you could glean from the instructions exactly what part of the body you're arranging in certain ways and what the outcome or the, the predictable outcome of that, that might be. Mm -hmm. We know, for example, if you read The Rise of Superman, he talks about extreme sports and the flow state. So what's offline in the flow state? The sense of self is offline. What's online? Perception comes online, like big time. What's offline is your body image. You're just in a sensorium, right? So you can, this is this extreme sport flow state. Then what happens when you're done, like jumping off the building or something, we also know that that subsystem, because it's so much online, what happens when it goes, when it relaxes, that just like an after image, the other systems, because they've been inhibited, they come online really big. So instead of having per person, perceptual, that subsystem, that flow state, you get this huge sense of self that's disembodied because it's been hypotrophied during the perceptual event. And so once that, and this is how the brain works and the body works, once that system gets exhausted, then you get a hypertrophic or amplification of the other systems and you get the runner's high, you get these addictive highs because this system is now exhausted. So you get to see one part of ordinary experience really expand and you become one with the mountain or one with the universe. And those are the systems that were dampened during the high perceptual. And we know that there's this natural, uh, I, wanna, I don't wanna say animosity, but tension or inhibition and disinhibition. So we can explain a lot of these experiences uh, if we understand uh, this modern neuroscience. Now, what I would say is that if Buddhism wants to be a science, and if you're a Buddhist, you could take Buddhism and it has two different connotations. There's the cultural aspect of being a Buddhist, of having compassion and love and respect for the living world. But in terms of the Buddhism that's a science, this Western Buddhism that claims to be able to make you aware of what's under the hood, then I think that you have to be conversant in these this this kind of contemporary neuroscience, which I think is is uh, is also in the right direction of repairing this mind body and human nature gap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot there, and I mean I'm sure that there are, um, you know I can't evaluate the the sort of the biological descriptions and the different systems that you're talking about it's kind of outside of my my field of understanding but you know that's a field that's evidently you know getting richer and more descriptive and more nuanced you know by the day you know there's a lot of work being done there and so as a descriptive enterprise as a empirical scientific descriptive enterprise it seems um you know totally fantastic to, to, to be able to do that and to have that information. Um, I have a, a few follow-up questions about how that type of understanding and that type of knowledge relates to um, what we think of, what we think of as contemplative practices and what they were sort of originally uh, created to do. So, but I guess the first question would be as practitioners of different types of exercise, you know, in the mode of practicing, what is it that you think we're, we're gaining from 
learning the scientific language or learning to, you know, if we're identifying these different types of states that we get access to, what, what shifts for us or what do you think could shift for us if we started adopting the language of, you know, the brain body neurosciences? Yeah, that's a good reframe. And it makes me realize that what I want to say is science is our friend, mm -hmm. but I don't think we have to adopt the language. Yeah. I think we have to re-examine the instructions in meditation. So for example, I might say to students, okay, let's start with, you know, get seated, let's do a body scan. And they start a body scan. And then I say, if you notice, in order to do a body scan, you've brought in a little picture of your body, right? to start at the top and then at the bottom. Where does that come from, right? So, so I am interested in pointing out instructions and first person science, but then we have to be very careful what, we, we, what we're trying to, uh, what the interpretation is. Be very careful what's actually going on. Um, so, um, and I can back up a little, like there's a lot of, there's a lot of, it runs from like being very amateurish to very subtly problematic. And I'll start with that more like amateurish. I constantly meet people who are doing embodied practices. And then they say it's really like they might say it's painful and then they say well you go in and there's trauma there and then you say well what's trauma and basically they've been working with a spiritual community in body practice but all they work with is thoughts mm -hmm. they're not it's not the body so that's that's gross negligence there's people who cannot actually they point to the body and it's not what you know it's more Thoughts. Now I know I'm, I'm in a paradox here because then I can point out that thoughts also come from the body, but that's not what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, that I think is problematic. But then at, at the, at some more sophisticated experiences, you can, um, you can ask, for example, one time I, I did an exercise on perception and we looked at blue and we looked at green and we looked at blue and we looked at green and we, we and and i said what is seeing a color and then finally they're like wow it's a body sensation like you could you could feel what it feels like to see blue and you could feel what it feels like to see green this may sound trivial to your audience but that's a key insight and if you look at thought, they're also, as Damasio said, the strange order of things. It seems to him now that they're feelings, that they're body sensations. Mm -hmm. Well, they are because they're, if you have inner dialogue, there's sub threshold micro states that are going on in your muscles that are creating sub threshold action patterns and not actions that then work as thoughts. And so, so I'm not against doing pointing out instructions. I think it's necessary, but I think the interpretation is tricky because we have a subtle mind-body duality or consciousness, physical body duality in the teachings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, it's not what your body's doing. It's what your mind is doing or what your... Con so every time that that move happens in your imagination, we could ask, what is the body doing such that this type of activity that we call mind arises? Right. So there's a tremendous emphasis on descriptive accuracy in what you're saying and becoming present to what's already happening, let's say. Um, and I think that certainly is a part of what's at stake in these conversations. And it's an important part. One of the distinctions that Evan was trying to point to 
wasn't just a sort of um, sort of anthropological or historical point that actually these Buddhist traditions of practice are also uh, embedded in cultures and rituals, communities, group activities, things like that. He wasn't he wasn't raising that, I don't think, just to point out that there's a different context. He was also saying that there's there's a whole normative and soteriological dimension baked into why people do the practices in the first place. It's not value neutral. It's not, um, it's not you know, the, the language he was using is, it, you know, it's a little bit confused to say we're trying to observe things as they really are. You know, and that's kind of where it connects with um, the work that I'm interested in, in in Western philosophical traditions, where the point is transformation, right? The point is maybe some kind of, a, you know, in the West, they talk about metanoia or conversion. You know, you have some kind of a, uh, an insight or, or practices that, that generate um, uh, ecstasis, right? Which ecstasis sounds like that kind of, you know, it literally means going outside of yourself. So when you talk about these different systems that have different observational capacities, you can kind of track them onto these different sort mm -hmm. of states and go, oh, okay, and the, the metanoia is this kind of turning around, you know, it's a, it's a transformation. But so my, my point is, is that there are, um, you're in pursuit of, of, of virtue, essentially, right? You're sort of either renunciating um, negative, sort of, we could call them vices or, you know, bad habits and moving in the direction of virtues. And we're trying to use those mechanisms and practices to transform ourselves into something different. And certainly descriptive accuracy seems like it plays an important role in that, but it also seems like the descriptions alone aren't really what it's about. So what what's the relationship there for you between um, you, you know, even even subtle and sophisticated neuroscientific description and sort of the possibility of transformation? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, what I'm proposing is certainly not value neutral. I'm pretty transparent. I think we need a spirituality that creates a sense of interbeing with the natural world. Mm -hmm. I can't prove that scientifically we need, you know, I can't, it starts off axiomatically with a virtue or a value. Um, and so, um, so that's, that's transparent, I think, um, for me. And, um, and I don't, I think there's different, different ways that we can create a sense of interbeing with the natural world, some of its nature mysticism. Um, but I think also where we're at today, where we're with what the world is like, um, I don't want to compartmentalize, you know, I don't want to have technology going out off in one direction and then have a little walk in the woods and have nature mysticism. But if I get really interested in communicating with nature and, and seeing how fascinating, then maybe I can marry technology to that enterprise. Um, I don't want to compartmentalize um, um, this my psychology with you know the the human psyche as something that is separate from nature. Um, but something that, that is dependent upon nature. I mean, our, our psyche needs, you, our set, human psychic energy needs to be absorbed by a large amount of nature, you know, just like our immune system is not in our body. It needs to be absorbed by natural processes. It's the extension of who we are. And um, so, so that's why um, I find science is our friend. Now, I would say that big picture science is our friend because people will go to school and you'll learn all the neurochemistry, you know, biochemistry of the ribosomes and you see those drawings and they, they trade electrons and, and you never get like, wow, how do those, how do they, how do they do that? You know, this is the, this is the, the way we hold science. I think people, it would be much more fascinating if we explain where we're going with this, you know, or um, I, I don't teach 
I don't even know them, the words for the different parts of the brain. You know, this is, this is not where I think we should put all effort mm -hmm. in, in this detail, but I think science can, can be spiritual. I think the scientific view um, can open us up into, um, I think it's very similar to indigenous people thinking of their ancestors, you know? What, where is the stardust? It's in my ancestry. You know, these things are, they're not metaphors in science. I don't know if they're metaphors in indigenous, indigenous cultures, but in science, they're literally true. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that is beautiful. And I, this is where you, you and Evan actually kind of open out the inquiry into well, one, you could call it a, you know, a philosophy of nature, or you could call it metaphysics. Uh, and you're both moving in the direction of uh, the work of Alfred North Whitehead. I mm. think, I don't know where Evan is today on the question of, you know, Whitehead's metaphysics. I know that process, you know, processes as relatively primary is uh, not such a radical claim these days, um, but the the other part that you're describing, which kind of opens up into a kind of panpsychism, is is something that uh, most scientists I think are still quite hesitant about. Maybe not extending something mind like into life and you know the living world. Maybe you could get some people on board with that. But then there's that boundary between the living and the non living, where um, someone like Whitehead kind of just, you know, pushes forward beyond that uh, barrier and suggests something very similar to what, what you're saying, which is that body is mind, mind is body. You know, he's, the schema is more complex than that. But in a sense, there's a kind of a non-duality between the two, two poles, he describes them like, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what is that? How does that vision of of nature or that philosophy play back into um, you know the conversation with with uh, with Buddhism and the neurosciences? Can, can you connect some of the dots there for us? Yeah, I think that I think that um, there's a lot of moves to pull this kind of thing off, you know, and it, and we're always in our community, a lot of us talk about like, there's a really big shift happening, you know, the shift from the axial age, from pre-axial age or pre-modern to um, the axial age revolution. I think that there's a lot of shifts that have to happen and one is metaphysical. So we can, we can move to um, a process metaphysics uh, similar to Whitehead. If you know my writing, I take quite a lot of liberty in, um, in echoing Whitehead, attributing to Whitehead, but moving it into more of this other kind of uh, approach. But I also think what's lacking and what is required, I think there's a, a new metaphysics, let's call it process metaphysics. It doesn't have to be panpsychism the way he, he, he talked about it, but certainly something that animates um, so we can, we need, we need the notion of self animating form. We have that, you know, Einstein said gravity is not a force that operate op, operates on objects, objects, gravity is what objects do. Uh, in physics, we're seeing a lot more of this kind of language, you know, electricity is not something that uh, exists above electrons. Electrons move, and that's what electricity is. You know, we're starting to see in physics a, the move toward self-animating form. And I know Einstein and Whitehead have some overlap. I don't know which came first. So we need that. We need to see that you don't need a third term like a mind or consciousness for form to have an intelligence and to do what it does. Okay, so this is very Taoist, right? Chi and Li. Um, they're, they're bounded together. Um, so that's one thing and Whitehead has that, you know, he has, he has, he has um, a metaphysics that um, you can go there. Whether, and then um, the other thing though we need is um, 
we need a new theory of change. It can't be new Newtonian theory because then we're like the mind, you know, has to push the body, which, you know, then like the, the, the brain has to make the intention, which pushes the body, these, these linear chains of the billiard ball model of causality is um, not serving us well. So we need a new theory of change to handle these complex, um, these living complex systems. And uh, I think that's, that's in the, third, the third pillar of it. So we need accurate observation of our own experience uh, and, and disciplined interpretation. Science is our friend, a new metaphysics. Um, and uh, it, we definitely need a new, new theory of change, I think. So um, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a lot to put in one podcast, but. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> um, how do you see the relation between, I go back and forth on this question. Obviously, I think generating new perspectives, uh, formulating new speculative philosophies, new sort of coherent metaphysics. I go back and forth between finding them incredibly important and sort of at the root of many of our problems, especially in terms of our relationship to uh, technology, but also how we think about uh, politics and anthropology. What, what is the human? What is the role of the human on the earth and all these kinds of questions? I often think of them as very important. And then sometimes I flip entirely and just think, you know, that we're, we're stuck in these systems that are so big and they're so powerful and they have so much sort of material inertia behind them that, you know, our, our ideas and our perspectives and our philosophies play almost no role in what happens next. You know, can you, <laughs> can you help me be more optimistic about why we should continue to do um, this kind of speculative thinking? Um, why we should. Yeah. Um, I do it because I think it's fun. Yeah. And um, um, well, it's an interesting question. I'm not someone who advocates for this stuff because I see a direct route from here to saving humanity. Right. Um, I think we're on the path we're on. Um, um, I think that I've said this before maybe even in the article I wrote for you that in general, like, you know, when I talk about the ribosomes, like how do they do that? And somebody might counter, well, they're not conscious because they don't know how they do that. But this is the same for us. We don't know how we learn to speak. We don't, all the big parts of being human, we don't, we don't know how we learned that, but we learned them anyways. We don't know how we learned at some point to have a self-reflected consciousness. And so it's these, these systems, these metaphysics, they're not there to create a blueprint and then we'll know how to do that. Right. They're just the process of becoming who we are. And, you know, if we're horrible cancer on the earth and that's who we are, then that's how it will play out. No one will stop it. If that's who humans are, uh, that's how it will play out. If we're going through a phase and there's some kind of uh, beautiful um, transformation on the other end and we can take credit for it as we usually do, I don't think we can even take credit for it. Then, then that will happen. And so for me, it's, the question of um, interest and clarity and uh, honesty mm -hmm. and um, trust. I mean, I have a great deal of trust in nature. And I think nature is, you know, we're riding on some rhythms of nature and um, Yeah. I'm not someone who says we should even like steward the earth. You know, I run a farm. I can't even keep my ducks a lot. <laughs> you know, the ducks are everywhere and the turtles eating the duck. And you, you, these things are very, they're very thick. These, mm -hmm. like you said, they're very thick. So mm -hmm. um, I'm not trying to get out ahead of something. 
right. and just trying to um yeah enjoy enjoy being a part of what interests me and you know sure. and uh and um and, it, and it's there's so much great immediately positive feedback you know when i put I put students in front of my horses and we played this notion, bodies in space are already a lot. And they're just like, wow, you know, we miss so much. Maybe we're all going to die and we're going to kill each other. But in the meantime, we miss so much. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think, uh, especially for children, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm having um, Matthew Siegel is coming on next week just has uh reissued um a new book on on whitehead and he, you know he also writes about friedrich schelling a lot um and these are people for whom uh, you know very much like you've been describing there's a continuity between what we think of as nature and what we think of as our sort of interior uh mental process you know to the extent that you know Schelling, I'm paraphrasing, you know, is famous for saying that our philosophical speculation is one of the ways in which nature kind of completes itself or nature comes to awareness of itself. And, you know, if we add, if we add to that, this idea of, of transformation through practice, it's also the way that nature doesn't just come to understand itself in a neutral way, but comes to change what it is to be nature. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that's also happening here that's that happens in these conversations that happens in the working out of these ideas and so i think that's one of the ways that um you know metaphysics and practice and a sort of a philosophy of nature kind of uh, conjoin you mentioned um you know that science should be our friend and i i very much agree with that um but there's also clearly a way in which um as you put it science can put us in a double bind where that you know that experience that we have of being in the world actually doesn't fit within the materialistic image of some of the sciences who are some of the people that we should pay attention to do you think who are who are writing in this vein who write um who write scientifically in this way that that maybe people don't know about um, you know, there's a great handbook called the Oxford Handbook of 4E Cognition. Mm. There's James Austin, Zen in the Brain. There's people like Sean Gallagher. All of those people I'm going to say are in the uh, 4E Cognition. Um, there's uh, uh, Buzaki, Buza- Rhythms of the Brain and uh, Mind from the Inside Out. Uh, Damasio, you know, Damasio is... Um, you talked about with Evan Thompson of Netzinger. The, 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 the problem with, um, I mean, I read all that stuff. I don't assign it because although we do read uh, James Austin's Zen in the Brain, for them to show up as scientists, they get very detailed and there's that language. And, and if you're a um, syn- synthetic or a syncretic, syncretic thinker, you start to see all these things as reinforcing each other. Um, so um, you could read, for example, uh, Jason Brown, who's a process philosopher, um, process and uh, process and the ugh, good life or his theories of microgenesis. So this is only either, either so either it's very hard to get through. It's like reading a really good book and there's too much math in it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So these people that you read as scientists, they are going to turn a lot of people away. So people like us, Evan Thompson's book, obviously, Waking, Dreaming and Dying. um, There's just enough neuroscience in there to get, um, to validate the claims um, and to move this big picture along and move this other view along. Um, But um, it is, there is a lot of science there and you have to be able to read with enough context so you get through those parts without losing the thread. And I know that's hard for people. On the other hand, people who popularize science, like what do we we know and stuff, that's, that's, that's way too um, out on, out in, in kind of storyland. So, um, 
yeah, there's not a lot of like go-to books. I would say Evan Thompson, obviously. Um, and the and if you look, get that book, uh, 4E Cognition, Oxford Handbook of 4E Cognition, it's a got nice overview of people doing doing a lot of uh, a lot of this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's what drew me to having these conversations with Evan, and you know, the conversations I've been having with other people as a result of that book have a lot to do for, for me with watching, uh, and I think this is true for you as well, watching um, to see which, which signals in these very rich and complex fields get upregulated into the popular imagination um, and then sort of simplified and taken as representations for, for the whole, which I think Evan was doing. And I think, because for me already, by the time you've gotten to a Sam Harris or a Robert Wright, um, you know, who in a certain public intellectual landscape are taken as sort of very rigorous minds, but in a kind of more academic intellectual space, they're, I don't want to sound too negative, but they're simplifiers. They're, they're mm -hmm. very, uh, they're flat in a lot of dimensions. Um, and so I think having Evan do this kind of secondary commentary, I see him as um, primarily focused on, like I said, you know, the neural Buddhism, Buddhist exceptionalism, which has all this like kind of sleight of hand movement involved in it, which simplifies and prepares a very rich tradition in advance and then packages it as something that's simply consistent with a certain kind of science. So you get mm -hmm. a very simple kind of uh, view of science and a very simple kind of view of Buddhism. And what I was trying to make clear in that podcast was, I don't think the validity of any of these traditions is secured or not by their consistency with this kind of science, mm -hmm. right? And so I don't know, that's just my, my kind of closing thought on it. And I think I see you kind of doing a similar thing, but in a different direction. And so I, I totally, I totally agree with you that we should be reading the science, um, and we should be reading the traditions in their in their context, you know, and in their their changing contexts, mm -hmm. you know. And um, these conversations, you know, help move that ball forward. I think, or at least I hope, you know, that's that's part of the the point of doing this. Yeah, and I just, you know, shout out to Evan, you know, there's very few books because, you know, the book he wrote, Waking, Dreaming, Dying, it's they're incredibly hard to write, to nuance. Is it Waking, Dreaming, Dying? Or I think it's Waking, Dreaming, Being. Maybe, uh, maybe no, he wrote two. Oh, okay. Yeah, two big books, I think. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember, but... Um, yeah, the one... Yeah, I Dreaming, because the Dalai Lama is, is dying, I think. Oh, right. Yeah, and and they're incredibly hard to write, you know. And yeah. Sam Harris, the way what how he writes is is <laughs> it's not that difficult to write that way. So yeah, yeah. Well, Evan Evan's a gift in that sense because his writing is, um, I think, as accessible as some of those topics can get. You know, he's very mm -hmm. very clear about it. Is there anything else that you wanted to share with people or any? final thoughts on um, this or anything else, really? No, I think it was a great conversation. And I just wanted to, uh, yeah, add some energy to the conversation in case some other voices are, are waiting, uh, are waiting in the background to, uh, yeah, chime in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And likewise, for me, um, this is very much an open inquiry. There is, I know there's one there's at least one anthology that also opens up this conversation into dialogues between uh, Buddhist practices and um, Pierre Hadot. And that's, like I said, that's kind of where I enter into this stream, knowing a little bit about, you know, the Buddhist conversation and a lot more about the Western conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and then how they all interact with, you know, these other issues of science and culture and history and anthropology. It's definitely an open uh, line of inquiry uh, for me and I know for many of the folks listening. So um, yeah, get in touch with me or get in touch with, with Benita. We'll leave the contact information in the notes. Um, I'll also, like I said, I'll link to those, the, uh, the essays and the other resources that we've been talking about here. And 
yeah, I invite people to to keep the conversation going. I think this is definitely, you know, rich and complicated and multidisciplinary enough that we need lots of voices, lots of dialogue. And, you know, maybe at some point we can even get a larger group together and do a kind of a more sustained sustained inquiry from from multiple perspectives. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Have a good day.